Well, thank you very much. And I'd also like to uh, thank the organizers for uh, having me. It's been a, so far, it's been a very, very wonderful visit and great conference. Didn't see the summer school that much, but I've only heard good things. So um, let's get started. So as you'll recall, Fanny gave a very comprehensive uh, survey uh, this morning, and so I can just highlight. Um, recall that if you take a, a subgroup G of um, O21 semi-direct product with R3, so a discrete subgroup of affine isometries of Minkowski space-time, and I'm going to specialize to the case where the linear part is Schottky, um, by results including results of DRUM, but I've, I haven't mentioned everybody involved, but, um, but uh, Todd DRUM um, introduced crooked fundamental domains for such actions and was able to show concretely how to get properly discontinuous actions. And then uh, Danziger, Cassel, and Guiritou uh, generalized to show, in fact, that um, any such G that acts properly discontinuously admits a crooked fundamental domain. So, that's uh, my very quick recall. And what I want to do today, um, the goal, or what I want to describe today, um, is how one can construct examples of what we could call Lorentzian Schottky groups um, acting on the Einstein universe, so three-dimensional Einstein universe. And how we're going to do that is we're going to use um, extensions of crooked planes, actually factifications of crooked planes called crooked surfaces, which were introduced by, by uh, Charles Frances. And I will try to explain to you a little bit how you can get these things. Well, I'll describe what they are. I'll describe, try to describe how to get them apart from each other. And we'll, we'll recover some of this, uh, these ping pong dynamics that we've, uh, that we've seen um, in the hyperbolic plane and in um, affine context. So maybe what I'd like to say is, um, like maybe many people, um, I get a lot of um, inspiration from the hyperbolic plane. I mean, we, there's so much more to discover, but on the other hand, we know a lot about the hyperbolic plane and its geometry. And it seems like when you're trying to discover new worlds, such as the Einstein universe, one thing that you might try to do is, can I use things that I already know and look at them in different contexts? So this is exactly what I'm proposing to do today, take Lorentzian, or take Schottky groups and see how we can extend them. But by no means am I trying to describe a very general picture. I mean, it's the, basically I'm going to give you pictures of examples, but uh, I think it's, we're far from a situation where we understand um, everything that's going on. So just a few pictures for today. Um, okay, so basically the Einstein universe is the projectivization of the light cone in Rn2. So today we're going to focus on n equal to 3. And I think Todd discussed a little bit of, talked about this in his course, and by the way, if you want, I know that his uh, slides are, are online, so you can go uh, check them if, if you need. But uh, So basically, I'm going to let R32 be five-dimensional real vector space, but I'm going to endow it with this, um, this dot product of signature 32. So I've got two minus signs at the end. And N32 is going to be the light cone of this space. So I remove, I remove the zero vector. And I take all of the vectors whose dot product with themselves are equal to zero. And the 3D Einstein universe is just the image of that cone under scaling. So I mod out by all multiples. So two vectors that are multiples of each other are, are equivalent. And I take the, the quotient of that light cone. And that's uh, the Einstein universe. And. Um, maybe just a little bit of notation. So I will use pi for the scaling map, but I'll also use these, uh, this notation for 
uh, homogeneous coordinates when I find that it's uh, useful. And um, maybe, is this the, yeah, so actually, so it's called the Einstein universe. Einstein himself um, studied uh, uh, this space, well, probably the higher dimensional one, but, because it is, it does admit what we call a conformal class of Lorentzian metrics. So it's a space time. Um, one explicit way to do this is you take, so I'm going to draw a, a picture which is a complete lie, but so you've got a light cone. And I just take, pick your favorite sphere. Okay, and so the restriction so, so, so that gives you actually a two-fold cover of uh, the Einstein universe. But when you restrict the dot product to that, to that set, to that subset, you actually get a, uh, a Lorentzian metric. So the indefinite uh, dot product restricts to a Lorentzian metric. And since you're just modding out by plus minus one after you can, if you take something like this, for instance, you just have, um, you have something very simple where you can get a new Lorentzian metric on the quotient, okay? So it's, a, it's a conformal class of Lorentzian metrics because if you pick a different sphere, you're going to get a different metric. So if you like to work in a metric, you just pick one, but you have to keep in mind that the isometries that you're going to have might not preserve that metric, but they're going to preserve angles. So that's why we talk about conformal class. But I, I just want to mention that, but I don't want to insist too much on that today. And if this is something that's a little mysterious to you, don't worry about it. You don't really need to, uh, to uh, understand that um, here. Maybe I want to mention here that for some authors, this two-fold cover is actually what they call the Einstein universe. So. The problem with our Einstein universe is it's non-orientable because when you mod out by the centipedal map in this context, you get something that's non-orientable. And some people like to work in orientable universes, so they take the two-fold cover, they call that the Einstein universe. So you just have to make sure that you read the introduction to the paper before you start going into chapter three. Oh, you can just take, for instance, you know, you take the induced apology and then take what is, oh, it's, um, it's a circle, so there's a, it's a, the pi one is, uh, the fundamental group is uh, generated by, um, by, one, uh, by one line. So it's got, it's got topology, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's S2, yeah, it's S2 cross was S1, so it's a, uh, and you mod out by an antipodal map and, and you get another, you know, something that's, but that antipodal map reverses orientation. Okay, I'll try to I'll draw some pictures later. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So, um, so yeah. So, so maybe so for me the Einstein universe is really the non-orientable one. So. One might say that it's the difference between taking projective space and taking the sphere of directed directions. Don't worry about that. But you know, this is, this is filmed, right? So I think I coined the term, Todd. Sorry, don't worry about that. You don't have to learn, you don't have to learn about the sphere of directed directions. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Um, so I'm going to draw a few pictures of uh, the Einstein universe. So as I said, it's S2 cross S1 modded out by uh, the product of the typical maps. Actually, so maybe I was unclear on that, but when you see that, when you, when you look at that equation, then you can see that it's, there's an S2 cross S1 going on, right? And I can't draw S2 cross S1, but what I can do is try to imagine how things would look if I, if I remove a few things. So 
So the first thing that I do when I'm drawing this, so I imagine that S2 cross S1 is, it's like a bracelet of pearls, the pearls being the S2s. And if I open the bracelet, then I get a string of pearls. Okay, and already that I can kind of imagine. But now what I'm going to do is on each of these pearls, I'm going to remove a single point. And so now I get like a shell bracelet. So I'm going to get a bunch of, of disks. So my picture of the Einstein universe, after removal of uh, these objects, I'm going to get something that looks like this. So all of my pictures are, are going to be drawn like this. So you see you've got, the, you've got an S1 like this, but I've removed a point, so I get a, an interval, if you like. And each of these disks is a sphere with, I don't know, say, you know, remove, remove the, the south pole off of all of the, uh, off of all of the spheres. Okay? And, um, and if, if you're really paying attention, You'll, you might want to know that um, I have two points here that play very special roles. There's one point here, which is uh, P0. And P0, by the way, it's here and it's also here. Because remember that this is glued to this via the antipodal map. Okay, so North Pole, South Pole, okay. And another important point is called P-infinity sometimes. And so it's here, but on this copy, which I've actually removed, but it's here. Once again, North Pole, South Pole. So I'm going to be drawing a lot of pictures, and sometimes I'll write P naught, P infinity. And those are actually the points that I mean, modulo calculation mistakes. OK? So um, and the, I'll, I'll explain later, if you're really trying to pay attention, uh, how I got those coordinates. But it'll come up. OK? So that's the picture of the Einstein universe that I'll be drawing in. And it's already extremely crooked, so it's, gonna, it's only going to degenerate. Thank you. So I said this is a, this is a, it's a Lorentzian manifold. It, it, it admits a Lorentzian class of metrics, so you, would ex you might be happy to know that there are certain Lorentzian objects that translate well into this context. I mean, you know, it, ha it just has to be. You have to be careful of the conformal class business, but other than that, you get a lot of objects that you're, uh, you're relieved to, uh, to recognize. So the first thing is what we call a photon, which is, you know, you might want to call it a light light geodesic or a light light line or something like that, but we call it a photon. And a photon is really, um, there are several, I think there are at least two um, definitions here. So the first thing is if you, if you take two null vectors, so two vectors in the light cone of R32, such that they themselves are orthogonal to each other, so their dot product is equal to zero, so you get a, you know, you get a, a, you get a plane and that's, that's degenerate with respect to the, to the dot product, but that projects to a line in the Einstein universe. And so it's going to look something, a photon is going to look something like this, for instance. Of course, that depends on how you project things, but this is a photon. Yes. I didn't say that, did I? No. Yeah, otherwise it would be boring. But yeah, it's linearly independent. So photons look like this. You can also, no, OK. That's all I'm going, to, that's I'm going to say that way. And if you take a set of photons coming out of a point or passing through a point, we're going to call that a light cone. So I've drawn two light cones here. But if I continue this picture here, if I take the set of all photons passing through P0, so 
So this is a like column. Okay, and um, this is another object that you find that arises quite naturally in the Einstein universe. You can also realize a like cone as, um, as the, uh, you take the, so you take a, a vector here, but I don't say what V is. Oh yeah, so if P is the projection of V, so V is a null vector, and so I take the orthogonal plane to V, which happens to contain itself, and I intersect that with the light cone, and then I projectivize. I'm going to get a like. Yes. Um, okay, I'm sorry, but I'm not, actually I'm not sorry. It's, yeah, it, and a lot of this is dependent on how you, uh, so actually you can. So, so that's the way this picture is using, it's like a banana. Yeah, 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 so, okay, let me underscore that. Is what, a, what a light cone looks like is if you took a torus and you took one of these meridians and you pinched it to a point. Picture in Ravi's talk, the picture in Fenny's talk. Everybody's been drawing this. Yeah, exactly. Okay. I find this a little dramatic though, so I like this one. I, I'll have more. Um, yeah, so those are light cones. I'll show you some more dramatic looking ones, I think. Ah, more light cones. What did I say? Yeah, so you see now I've got, I've got three light cones here. So you've got this one here. So yeah, so I didn't, I didn't say it, but you probably read it, is that these two light cones here intersect in a circle, which is actually a space-like circle, but let's not, let's not worry too much about that here. And through that point, this is, this is the light cone going through that point, okay? And actually, Okay, I, I, I'm not going to get ahead of myself, but you, know, you, you kind of see the straight line and it kind of suggests, what does it suggest? It suggests something like a tangent plane to a light cone, dot, dot, dot. Okay, so these are, these are more light cones. There's also something called, uh, what we call an Einstein torus. Well, the Einstein torus is a two-dimensional Einstein universe, and, but they, they arise in this context. And um, how we get an Einstein torus here is, so I'm going to draw the picture, and you can read that here. And I'm again going to try. At some point, I get tired of drawing cylinders, but not quite yet. What you want to do, and I'm going to take my P naught and my P infinity again. So I've got P naught, and I've got P infinity here. So these are two points. This is a pair of points in the Einstein universe that do not lie on a common photon. That's the first ingredient when you're building an Einstein torus. So that means that their light cones intersect in a circle that is space-like. And what we're going to do is we're going to pick any two points on this intersection. So maybe I'll pick these two points. And I'll call this one F1, and I'll call this F2. So maybe this is P1 if I'm using the notation here, and, I'm, and this is P2 if I use the same notation here. Okay. So what, that, what happens is now once I've picked these four points, this actually, these four points, they, they come from four vectors who span, and the four vectors, so they span a four-dimensional uh, subspace of R32, which actually has a metric of signature 2, 2. So what we're going to do is we're going to get a, um, the, the projective 
the projectivization of the light cone of a copy of R22. And that's going to be an Einstein torus. And any, any such surface that arises from such a choice of four points, we're going to call an Einstein torus. And so here, for instance, the, um, the Einstein torus determined by these four points is really just, you can think of it as, I take this arc of great circle, which actually corresponds to this one too, times S1. Okay. So remember, all of these points here are one point, but so I get so I, I get something that closes up into a torus. Okay, and uh, yeah. So there are a lot of words here, but uh, that's pretty much it. And so, fun facts about the Einstein torus. So it is a torus. It is a torus, but its, it's, it's complement is connected because the Einstein universe, three-dimensional Einstein universe, is, uh, is non-orientable. So this, by the way, it's a, fun, uh, it's a fun, fun trick question to put on an exam if you, uh, if, if you want. You know, the, the fact that you've got this, you've got a torus which has only one side because it's in a non-orientable space. So this could, this could, you can, you can, no, this is really a torus. It's really a torus, but it's only got one side. So exercise. Or I could say, for instance, so if you're on this side of the torus on this picture here, and you come out here, but this gets attached via the antipodal map to the other side. So it's, uh, so it's tricky, but it's uh, something to contemplate while you're on the bus, but not while you're driving. <laughs> Get you in trouble. Um, also, and maybe this is a simpler way to think of it, but it's, it's also just the compactification of the, the um, orthogonal plane to a space-like vector in R32. But somehow that's... It's totally equivalent way of thinking. It's the, it's just that vertical plane. Yeah, so the edges are just getting glued regular, regularly, and then you've got this antipodal map. I mean, it's a little funky, but, but I promise it's a torus. Yeah. <laughs> we should we should te teach a topology class. We should te teach a topology class together. Drive the students nuts. Um, This gets mapped. This gets mapped to here, and then it took me a while to. <laughs> there was a 50, 50 chance that I wasn't going to do that properly. By the way, so I'm not even sure if I did. Somebody's going. She's wrong, but we're going to let her go. So I mentioned something about conformal compactification, and Todd talked about this last week. But um, I just wanted to be just a little bit explicit here, and just to show you exactly the map that I'm using to um, embed um, Minkowski space-time, or actually the affine space um, modeled on Minkowski space-time, into the Einstein universe. So there's my map. So a vector v gets sent to this, and um, 
it's, this actually, it, it's convenient. Okay, there are several different ways of mapping. I, I'm willing to bet money that Todd didn't use the same map, but it's, uh, I don't know. I'm, I like this one. And, and so you can, you, can map the, um, you can map the vector space in, in that way. And it maps R21, or what I call here V, it maps it to a neighborhood of P0, but even much more explicitly than that, and I think I say this on the next slide, it actually, the image of the map is everything except the light cone of P infinity. Okay, so if I, if I remove this light cone, what I'm going to have left is something that looks like Minkowski space-time. Okay, so this is what we, I mean, this is a, this is a conformal compactification, but I don't want to get into the, the nitty-gritty of that, but uh, that's pretty much the, the picture. And in that sense, I don't, see, so what I alluded to before, if you take, um, remember I had these light cones, like, I had a light cone like this, and that's the Im that is actually the image of a um, tangent plane to the light cone in Minkowski spacetime. So if you take the light cone based at zero, so zero gets mapped to P zero, or zero gets mapped to P naught, and the, 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 the tangent space to the light cone, a tangent space to the light cone at P naught, which is a plane, gets mapped to what's something that looks like a light cone in this picture. So I find that um, really fun. So it looks like I'm going to talk about crooked surfaces now. And um, I think I'm going to finish early, too, so yay for me, right? Unless you ask me tons of questions. So crooked surfaces, as I mentioned before, were introduced by Charles Frances to study these uh, conformal compactifications of marvelous space times, which have been discussed. And um, one way to define very quickly a crooked surface is you just take a crooked plane and you, 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 you place it into the Einstein universe versus the map iota that I described before, and you compactify. So you take the conformal compactification of that, okay? We're going to discuss um, a way of defining a crooked surface that perhaps is more synthetic or looks more like how we define crooked planes um, in the Minkowski space, but it's, um, but the, the key point that's going to come up is that it's, it's also, in a way, well, I say it is determined by a set of four points. As for an Einstein torus, there'll be, there'll, we'll have to make some choices. But it's almost determined. Okay. So how to make a crooked surface, step one. It's, it's going to have a stem. And the stem is going to lie in an Einstein torus, okay? So what I want you to think of, at the end it's gonna look like I drew the same picture over and over again. Except this one is a little bigger. It's in the same conformal class. Um, and then I forgot what I was going to say. Okay, so I have, so I want you to think of what a stem looks like for an actual crooked plane. So it, right, in, 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 R3, in R2, in R21, a stem looks something like this, right? We take a plane, we take a plane that intersects the light cone in two lines, and we take the part that consists of time-like vectors, time-like directions. So what you have to imagine is you if, you, if you start from this point and you look up, what you're gonna see, you're gonna see a wedge, okay? So same thing here. Actually, what you're going to do is 
this plane is going to be promoted to an Einstein torus. So you're going to take an Einstein torus And what the stem is going to look like, so I have to, and there's some, there's some little bit of nuts and bolts here, but you basically want to reproduce what you did in Minkowski space. So you're going to take all of these points here, but you have these extra ones here. This actually corresponds to the, uh, the bottom part. Okay. And you have, to, you have to think that here, if, if I thought I was, if I was thinking of this as being in Minkowski space, this light cone here is at infinity. So as I go up like this, I'm going up like this. Okay, so I have a stem like so. In this picture, how clear is it? It's not really clear at all, but it's, it's this yellow part and this yellow part and a yellow part here. And I underscore the fact that this part is glued to this. So you really just get two, two lozenges. Okay. By the way, the pictures look here a little awful because I actually drew these in Mathematica using, using parametr. If, so actually, if you're, if you're at all interested, so I used parametrizations in Minkowski space time. And then I projected them into the Einstein universe and then passed them through my grinder of removing a line and removing a sphere. So all these, you know, these, were, these were perfectly straight lines um, three, th three maps ago. And this is what happens. And so mathematics kind of freaks out here. So, but I think it's kind of interesting for archaeological purposes to see just how bad it can get. And so somewhere in here you see you kind of see, you know, you've got the scrunching lines are all getting packed together as they go to infinity. Okay, so as they get close to infinity, things start to bunch up. Okay. It, am I too far away? You know what? It might actually just be upset at the size of the next picture. I'll wait to get that. Well, that was French Canadian. When you apparently, when you speak French Canadian to the projector, projector, it, it listens. It knows I mean business. Um, so now you add two wings. So what are wings? What were wings in Minkowski space? They were. You took tangent planes to the light cone and you, put, you picked the half plane, right? So those were wings. You had one like this and one like that. Well, what's a half tangent plane to a light cone? It's a, it's a half light cone in the Einstein universe. So here, what you're going to do is you're just going to take a half light cone here and a half one there. And you pick them so that they don't, they only intersect in these two points. Okay, so it's really just, it really is just the conformal compactification of, of a, a regular crooked plane, but you get much more because you can, you can get these crooked surfaces based not only, you can, put, you can base them anywhere, including at points on the light cone of P infinity. So you, you've got a lot more, you've got a lot more flexibility and you're moving them around with a lot more, more maps. So that's just what it looks like. So you've got, so you've got this lozenge here, this one here, and then you're going to get. I'm not going to draw it because it'll get too busy. But you've got, you've got a half cone, coming out here, and it's going in the blackboard on the other side, and on this side it's going, in here, out here, bulging out here. Okay. Yes. Yeah, you would see, yeah, you see like these two bulgy things. Yeah, really nice wallpaper, I think. 
So what's it going to be, John? What's it going to look like? What do you think? When we glue, where are we going to get? That's okay. Why, why am I picking on you? <laughs> I, you know, I've got the memory of a goldfish, so you know, welcome to my world. Um, oh, yeah, and I, oh, well, I just showed the answer, but so the light cones are going through F1 and F2, so that data, that initial data that I told you about, P1, P2, F1, F2. So P1 and P2, basically, you know, you take out, you know, the stem comes out from P1 and ends at P2, if you want to think about it that way. And the, the wings that you're taking, the leg cones that you're taking, are based at F1 and F2. Okay, just. And now it's so. Uh, so it's homeomorphic to a Klein bottle. So it's an unorientable surface. But Einstein universe is still not oriented, so this time actually, and this is nice, this is one of the nice things about um, crooked surfaces is that they, they're, now they're, if you, if you remove them, um, the complement has two connected components, so there's sides. There's two sides to a <laughs> crooked surface, which is the real reason why I don't work in the double cover, because you, in the double cover, of course, it's two-sided, there's nothing to it, but here it's actually kind of a neat fact. So. So, so now you've got these things that look like, now this is really a cartoon image, but if I were to draw the most, a very general picture, a photon would look something like this, and a crooked surface in a cartoon way, would look something like this. Okay, and I haven't I haven't at all explained why, but you can you can use crooked surfaces as um, as bounding tubular neighborhoods of photons. Okay, so there you can use them to build fundamental domains for Schottky type groups. And actually, this is exactly what Chafon says. Did he? He, uh, he, he, he used this, but he, you know, he was actually using uh, compactification, compactifications of crooked planes. So they all intersected in one point. And the game we're going to play in the next 20 minutes is we're going to see how we can really pull them apart and really get them disjoint from each other. Okay, and I've got to learn my slides by heart instead of just always saying them before I wrote them. And so what we're going to do here is just, like I say here, is we're going to remove the last point of intersection. So in, my, in Minkowski space, we can move these away from each other, as was uh, illustrated in, in several talks so far. And we just need to do it one more time at the point at infinity at P infinity. Okay. So I'll, I'll try to illustrate this with pictures. And I'm going to do it in three steps. So we're going to go through a little bit of a reminder. Okay, so I'm going to. Okay, so like I said, I'm start, in my mind, I'm always starting with the hyperbolic plane. Okay, so in the hyperbolic plane, and I'm going to use, I'm going to use a, a model of the hyperbolic plane where geodesics look like straight lines. Okay, so maybe something like this, for instance. Okay, this looks like a, a Schottky group. And so maybe I have something like this. Okay, so I'm, I've, I'm illustrating a Schottky group on two generators acting on H2. Okay, they're disjoint, so 
you've got ping pong dynamics, it's going to be everything you want it to be. Okay? And then, so then what do we do when we go to, when we promote to Minkowski space? So we, in Minkowski space, we're thinking of this. Let me draw it this way. We're, you know, maybe we're thinking of it this way. Right, so we've got these things like this. And now I'm going to take a bird's eye view. I'm going to look at a z equal to something. And I'm going to still see things like this. But to get crooked planes, I'm going to add wings. Right? This is what Todd explained to you and Fanny reviewed this morning. But we somehow need to get these apart from each other, right? Because what we want is we want them to be disjoint in order to bound a crooked fundamental domain. And perhaps this, the, this, this, the simplest way we found to do this is to just pull them apart in a parallel way. So let me, let me draw it this way. So I've got, my, I've got my stem. So this is my crooked plane. Okay, and I've got one wing coming out that way, and I've got the other one going out that way. And I have this neat little quadrant here, which is called the stem quadrant. And what you, you, you probably learned last week is if I, if I just slide the crooked plane so that the vertex lies in the stem quadrant. So literally, I'm just using a translation that's parallel to the plane containing, containing the stem, but I place the vertex in the stem quadrant. And now I'm going to get, I don't know, it's getting a little busy, but you know, maybe I get something like this. And I get a new crooked plane. I just you know, moved everything along. And maybe what that looks like here, maybe it looks something like this. OK, I just, I just slid it. And I do this for every single one of them. And one thing that we know is that as long as I stay within that stem quadrant, in the interior of the stem corner, everything is going to be disjoint from each other. So I do that here, I do that here, and I do it with the other two. Well, not that I'm obsessive compulsive or anything, but I think I have to do this for all four of them now. If you're just waking up, I'm sorry. I know that looks terrible, but it's, uh, you have to follow the whole thing. So you get them away from each other, and that's how you build a crooked fundamental domain in, in Minkowski space. And now you just have to you know, remember what were the translations that you used to move one vertex to the other, and that's how you assign translational parts. Right? So this is what we did here. And we just moved the vertex in the stem quadrant. That was it, right? And and one thing that we show is that as long as you move in the stem quadrant, we actually have these crooked half spaces. So the initial crooked half space contains the new crooked half space. Okay, so when you're sliding like this, maybe I want to make this next picture because it's kind of important, but you start with these two crooked planes. that intersect in a point. And once, you've, once you slide them away from each other, you slide them away from that common vertex. 
And the two crooked half spaces only intersected in that point. So by sliding them away from each other, you actually get your new crooked half spaces are disjoint. So that's how, that's how you get this uh, kind of stuff. Now, as I, know, as I mentioned, in the Einstein universe, the thing is, is you've got this vertex here, P1, but crooked surfaces have a, have a second vertex, P2. And, well, it turns out crooked surfaces are, are very um, symmetric versus relative to these two points. And so, yeah, that's what I just said. So st step three is we're just going to do the same thing at infinity. Okay. Now, on the slides, if you read the slides, it looks a little complicated. And when I first started thinking about these things, I had a little bit of a complicated way of thinking about it. But I, I'm, starting to, I'm starting to refine it. But it's, it's, still, it's still up here. By the way, this is um, starting here, I think, is, uh, is uh, joint work with some uh, former students of mine. Uh, Dominique Francaire and uh, Rosemont de la So They're not here, but I mentioned them anyways. So you, what you want to do is you, you need to pull away not only at these vertices, this P0, you have to move them away from each other, but also at P infinity or P2, you have to move them away from each other as well. And one way to describe this is to choose an involution which um, exchanges basically the two points. And then you just, whatever translation you did on the bottom, or whatever translation you could do on the bottom, you just do to the top. But let me, let me draw a picture for you that I think is a little bit, will maybe let you see what we're really doing here. Um, it's the same picture again. I could just draw the, the Einstein torus, but somehow I think it's helpful to see it in the context. So, yeah, so I have P1 here, I have P2 here. P1, oops, P1, P2, P2. So I can move P1 anywhere in its stem quadrant. So I'm going to put it here. So this is my new P1. I guess I'll call it P1 prime. Okay. And well, OK, so now I have. I have two photons coming out of it. So it's the two, there's a whole light cone coming out of it, but I'm taking the pair of photons that actually live in this Einstein torus. OK, it's a little crooked, but oh, I'm not done here. OK, but you should think that, so this point is identified to this one. And then I have this is glued to this. What? No, it does not meet at that point. Okay, let me let me just can I, I'm just gonna I have to think about it. So, I mean, this does, this is fine. This goes like this, okay, and this goes. Yeah, but I still don't see how I'm supposed to. <laughs> Let me just erase, and I'll start again. Hey, something had to go wrong. OK, I'm going to vouch for this one. It's 
So this actually gets mapped. You know, this might actually just be too, um, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm not gonna vouch for this one. This is why we should always let machines make decisions for us, said the character in the prequel determinator. Okay, I'm gonna draw this a little bit less. So. Want to go? So P1 was P1 prime was here. Yeah, it's, and I'm going to make it go a little bit <laughs> so less likely to to crash. Okay, and then the other one I'm going to do like this, and it's going to come up like this. Okay, and so this gets mapped to this by the end. So maybe just okay. So I've moved P1. Now, if I were doing this like uh, Shal Frances was doing, um, by the way, he did much more than this. Okay, I did, I'm not suggesting this is. Uh, I mean, the work that he did was extremely, extremely central to to what we did later. But um, so if I were just going to do this then my new stem, and I'm not going to draw it, but I'm just going to point to it. My new stem would be, I would have one lozenge here, because I've got the two lines coming out of P2. This is my new F1 and my new F2, right? And then I've got another lozenge here, right? But the thing is, I'm going to do the same thing to P2 now. I'm going to move P2, and, um, and this is where I'm going to get in real trouble, so. So you have to pay attention. So P2 prime is going to go, um, but I don't want to get in too much trouble. So I'm, 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 okay, I'm going to be a little bit of a wuss, and I'm going to put P2 prime here. Okay, because now I'm a little afraid. And, and I'm going to do the same thing, but since I'm a wuss, it should be a little bit easier not to get into trouble. And it's going here, and then there's another one um, going here. And you know, it's going to look something like this. So what's my new stem now for my new crooked surface? Well, it's this. There's, here's one. When the cleaning ladies go through my room in the guest room, they're just going to find pictures of this all over the place. It's, they might get a little uh, concerned. And there's another rhombus kind of trying to hide out here. Whoops. And now to create a crooked surface, you have to, you have to fit in one half light cone here another light, half light cone here. And yes, yeah, there's, there's yeah, there's, and, and so, but the, and the, but the way that I've constructed this thing, it remained in this crooked, well, this half space bounded by the crooked surface that I started with. So I'm going to get everything disjoint from each other, okay? And if, if I were to take the last five minutes, what I would try to do is to try to tie this in with um, what uh, Fanny and uh, Jeff and uh, Francois have done in anti de Sitter three space and tie it in with stuff that, some observations that Bill Goldman made about how crooked surfaces in the Einstein universe relate to um, anti de Sitter crooked planes because um, Einstein universe con contains a double, cop a double cover of anti de Sitter space. And if you do this really carefully, you can build examples of uh, groups that act, on, um, that act properly on anti de Sitter space. 
but I'm not going to do this. But what I will do is I will show you my very last picture. This is an awful picture. This is Mathematica telling me, forget it. I'm not going to, I'm not going to work for you anymore. And so, but these are, these, and these aren't even, they're not even crooked surfaces. I think I only drew the stems. But can you tell? But this is, this is basically four crooked surfaces. And you can imagine, and, and of course, look, they're disjoint. <laughs> and you just map one, like map the green to the yellow, and map the magenta to the red. And if you, if you repeat this process, you're going to get the, these ping pong dynamics. And you're going to get a, a limit set. Well, it, yeah, it's a Kokarni limit set of, of, of photons, because you're going to get a bunch of fixed points for um, all of the elements of the group, but you're also going to get the photons. For each element of the group, you need to take the attracting, the pair of attracting fixed points, and you take the photon that relates them. And this is the limit set that you get, but you get this Cantor set worth of, uh, of photons. So this was actually first observed by uh, Charles Frances, and so these yield what he called Schacke groups. And I managed to use up all my time. I, I'm shockingly slow, but I will thank you very much for your patience. <laughs>